Welcome to the Coin Bureau Weekly Crypto Review. Here are this week's top headlines in the crypto news. Money printer go brrr. US administration announces colossal $6 trillion spending plan for 2022 as traders short the dollar by borrowing to buy stocks and crypto. But what does this all mean? Bitcoin miners of the world unite why the recently formed Bitcoin Mining Council is raising some concerns about centralization. The tyranny of the majority. A Uniswap whale puts down millions of Uni tokens in favor of its own treasury proposal. What was the outcome? DeFi dominates while the crypto market deflates. A new report by PricewaterhouseCoopers reveals that crypto hedge funds are buying DeFi tokens like mad. A close look at their top token picks. Building bridges between popular cryptocurrency blockchains. REN adds support for Polygon and Phantom. But why hasn't the REN token pumped? Big Tech stepping up its crypto game. PayPal and Robinhood plan to let users withdraw their cryptocurrency as Apple opens a job position looking for a crypto payments expert. Fact checking the FUD. Coinbase CEO announces the introduction of Coinbase Fact Check while internal sources reveal the US exchange is about to launch its own crypto media company. Back in Washington, the SEC begins its official review of two more Bitcoin ETF applications. Could we see a Bitcoin ETF by year's end? And finally, a close look at the crypto market and why the bull market is far from over. All this and more in just a sec. Good morning, afternoon or evening. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Guy and what you're about to see is educational content, not financial advice. You can find any topics you're looking for using the timestamps in the video timeline. And now for today's top stories. The current US administration revealed its 2022 spending plan on Friday and boy is it a doozy. Of the $6 trillion they hope to spend next year, $1.5 trillion will go towards military operations, $2.3 trillion will go towards stimulating the economy, and $1.8 trillion will go to low-income households. To pay for all this spending, the current administration is planning to increase corporate taxes and increase capital gains taxes for individuals with more than $1 million in income. To make sure those taxes get paid, the IRS will be expanding its operations, and this includes requiring crypto companies to report all transactions worth more than 10 grand to the IRS. As mentioned in last week's Coin Bureau news report, these reporting requirements will not come into force until 2023 and will have a minimal effect since most crypto traders report their gains and losses to the IRS already. This news couldn't be more bullish for things like stocks and cryptocurrencies because there is a high likelihood that a portion of that $6 trillion will inevitably find its way into asset markets. This has traders so bullish that they are borrowing more money than ever to buy stocks and cryptocurrencies, according to MarketWatch. The reason for this is simple. The US government has effectively confirmed that it will continue to take on debt and keep printing money so it can keep spending. This means it will have to keep interest rates low or else it won't be able to pay back that debt. Keeping interest rates low also makes it very convenient for traders to borrow money to invest with. The fact that government money always makes its way into the market means any investments they make are almost guaranteed to go up in value, assuming they diversify, of course. This is all well and good, but the inflation the government is creating could cause serious issues for the economy further down the line and some believe those issues are closer than we think. I'll leave a link to my recent video about inflation if you want to learn more about how it affects the crypto market. Following mainstream media misconceptions about the effects of Bitcoin mining on the environment, a conglomerate of crypto miners came together last week to form the Bitcoin Mining Council. According to MicroStrategy CEO Michael Saylor, who arranged the meetup, the Bitcoin Mining Council exists to, quote, promote energy usage transparency and accelerate sustainability initiatives worldwide. 
Tesla CEO Elon Musk also has a seat at the council table and called the formation of the Bitcoin Mining Council, quote, potentially promising for the future of Bitcoin. Not everyone has the same opinion, however. Many are drawing parallels between the Bitcoin Mining Council and OPEC, a conglomerate of oil producers who have significant influence over the price and distribution of oil around the world. After all, the beauty of Bitcoin is that anyone can join the network to process transactions and earn BTC. The fact that the identities of the people involved is not truly known adds to Bitcoin's security as a payment network, since nobody knows how many people are actually mining or where they are. The Bitcoin Mining Council is looking to push crypto miners to reveal how they are generating energy to ensure they're using renewable sources like wind and solar. Now, not only does this compromise the relative anonymity of those mining Bitcoin, it also foreshadows a world where Bitcoin mined from an energy source deemed to be bad for the environment could be blacklisted, i.e. any miners who aren't part of the club. Some prolific crypto investors, such as billionaire business magnate Kevin O'Leary, have already noted that they will only buy Bitcoin mined in North America by miners using sustainable energy. The thing is that the financial incentives to seek out renewable energy already exist in proof-of-work cryptocurrency mining since renewable energy costs half as much as fossil fuel alternatives. Up to 80% of all Bitcoin mining is done with renewable energy already, and this trend towards renewable crypto mining will continue regardless of the presence of some organizing body. This has left many wondering why the Bitcoin Mining Council is required at all, and questions are starting to arise around its true intentions. A similarly concerning development last week was the takeover of Uniswap's governance system by a uni whale. The uni whale in question was the blockchain arm of Harvard's law school, which pledged a whopping 10.46 million uni in favor of its proposal to fund crypto lawyers, lobbyists, and political groups. According to the details on Uniswap's governance forum, the proposal would seek to allocate 1 to 1.5 million uni tokens to create a community elected political grants committee to represent DeFi interests. The four areas of focus of the political grants committee would be to educate policymakers, achieve regulatory clarity for DeFi, advance laws that support DeFi and community governance, and get other DeFi communities involved in the first three initiatives. The vote concluded with nearly 66% of voters in favor, 34% against. Since it did not reach the minimum threshold of 40 million votes in favor, the proposal was not passed and will not be enacted. Now, while the issues the proposal seeks to address are legitimate given the regulatory concerns surrounding DeFi of late, many rightfully pointed out that just a handful of uni whales could potentially collude to pass whatever proposals they want. Thankfully, it looks like this won't be happening anytime soon, as enough uni whales are aware of the risks Uniswap proposals like the recent one could have on the longevity of the protocol. Compound Finance founder Robert Leshner is one of these whales, and on Twitter, he noted that proposals like these could turn Uniswap into a, quote, slush fund. Given the massive amount of uni tokens Harvard's blockchain law and fintech initiative has, it's a wonder why it didn't simply use some of its own uni to spearhead these initiatives. The answer might be because selling so much uni on the open market could crash its price, but there seems to be no shortage of DeFi token buyers these days. PricewaterhouseCoopers' third annual crypto hedge fund reveals that big money is flowing into DeFi tokens. Their top picks are the Aave token, Chainlink's Link, and, oddly enough, Polkadot's Dot. The Aave token is arguably a no-brainer, given the power of the Aave protocol. Nearly $20 billion of cryptocurrency is currently being borrowed and lent on Aave, not to mention the millions of dollars in flash loans still executed from time to time. More importantly, Aave is one of the only cryptocurrency projects I've seen that's taken the time to think about issues like customer service in a decentralized environment. They're also one of the only DeFi protocols that have been pushing to appeal to institutional investors, and they seem to be making a mark in that regard. Chainlink's Link token is also a logical choice, given that it's required for almost every DeFi protocol to function. 
This is because Chainlink's data oracle feeds the price data required to do things like trading, lending, and borrowing. Without that data, those DeFi dApps would be useless. Polkadot's DOT might seem like an odd choice until you remember that parachain slot auctions are fast approaching. As I mentioned in my recent video about Kusama, parachain slot auctions are just weeks away from arriving on Polkadot and will be beginning on Kusama soon if they haven't already. This will open up a massive DeFi ecosystem that many institutions and thousands of individuals have been waiting for. Best of all, PwC found that 86% of crypto hedge funds plan on allocating substantially more capital to crypto by the end of the year. These crypto hedge funds are not just buying DeFi either, they're also using DeFi. According to the report, 30% of crypto hedge funds are using decentralized exchanges, primarily Uniswap. Given that all the DEXs they cite are on Ethereum, something tells me that these hedge funds might be contributing to the crazy gas fees we've seen in recent months. Now, luckily for regular retail users like you and me, there are plenty of alternatives to choose from, and they're becoming more and more viable by the day. Layer 2 scaling solutions for Ethereum like Polygon and Ethereum alternatives like Phantom have become increasingly popular over the last few months. One of the major hurdles to the adoption of these protocols has been the relative absence of popular assets like Bitcoin on their smart contract chains. REN makes it possible to use Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Digibyte, Dogecoin, Filecoin, Terra, and even Zcash on other blockchains via its REN bridge. This makes REN one of the most powerful projects in the cryptocurrency space, and it's one that I still believe to be insanely undervalued given its utility. Rather than locking your BTC with a centralized party like BitGo or Binance to mint wrapped BTC or BTCB, you lock your crypto in a smart contract custodied by a network of dark nodes to mint REN BTC. I'll leave my last video about REN in the video description if you want to learn the ins and outs of how its protocol works. But the main takeaway here is that your crypto is never kept with a centralized party. Moreover, REN's bridging between assets introduces much-needed liquidity to decentralized applications, which significantly increases user experience. I'm going to guess that most of you have got REN's price open on a new tab already while you listen to this video, and you're probably wondering why it's so far down the rankings. Well, the short answer is that REN's value is fundamentally dependent on how many wrapped cryptocurrencies it has issued on the four smart contract blockchains it currently supports. Right now, the markets are extremely volatile, and this has weak hands dropping their crypto and diamond hands clutching their crypto rather than using it in DeFi protocols. Make no mistake, however, as soon as the market starts to rebound and DeFi starts to take center stage, REN will be an invaluable part of that. Speaking of staying away from cryptocurrency custodians, the folks over at PayPal and Robinhood seem to have gotten the memo that the average user prefers to hold their crypto in their own personal wallet. PayPal revealed this news during Coindesk's consensus event with PayPal exec Jose Fernandez de Ponte, noting that, quote, we want them to be able to take the crypto they acquired with us and take it to the destination of their choice. Though he did not provide a definitive date for when this feature will become available, Jose noted that we could expect to see it within the next two months. Robinhood's new crypto COO, Christine Brown, is trying to steer the corporate bandit ship in a similar direction, according to a recent interview with Decrypt. Like all great things in cryptocurrency, the move comes in response to Robinhood's competition, most of which already allows users to withdraw their crypto as they please to do things like dabble in DeFi. While a solid date for Robinhood's crypto withdrawal feature has also not been set, it seems that it will come much later than PayPal's. According to Christine, this is primarily because they need time to remind their traders that crypto transactions are irreversible and that transaction fees can cost quite a bit. Christine also noted that cryptocurrency staking, lending, and borrowing is also being considered. Now, until these features are implemented, Robinhood's 10 million crypto traders will continue to deal in IOUs and not the real thing. On that note, it looks like Apple is looking to deal with the real thing with its recent career opening. The position posted to Apple's career website seeks a business development manager 
for alternative payments, including cryptocurrencies. Although the compensation for this position is not noted, it must be hefty given that the ideal candidate requires a minimum of 10 years' experience in financial services and five years' experience with cryptocurrency payment providers. That's a pretty big ask, considering that cryptocurrency has only been around for 12 years, and most of the payments infrastructure around crypto is barely five years old, if that. Apple's job posting is reminiscent of PayPal's own job posting last summer, which was looking for cryptocurrency payment experts. A few months later, cryptocurrencies became a part of PayPal services. Another crypto company that's always hiring is Coinbase, which seems to be making its foray into crypto media. In a recent blog post by CEO Brian Armstrong, he notes that, quote, every company is becoming a media company because of social media. Coinbase is taking this idea two steps further by introducing a fact check section to the Coinbase blog and launching its own dedicated crypto media company. Coinbase Fact Check will aim to publish facts about the company and cryptocurrency and take an active rather than reactive approach to fake news about its brand. More importantly, Brian claims that this section of Coinbase's blog will highlight any mistakes or shortcomings of the company and how it plans to address them. In terms of its media aspirations, Coinbase is apparently on the cusp of creating crypto media of its own. According to Axios, the media editor in charge of the operation will report directly to Coinbase. Now, while this move has been met with some criticism over how objective Coinbase's new media venture will be, the fact of the matter is that no news outlet is entirely impartial. This is because every publication is paid for by someone. Jeff Bezos pays the bills at the Washington Post, and Consensus presumably pays the bills at Decrypt Media. Even for people like me who aren't beholden to any private investors, I have my own personal biases when it comes to covering certain crypto projects. Everyone has their own agenda and opinion, and that's fine, so long as there is a diversity of ideas about a given topic available to the average person. Now, I reckon most reasonable people would agree with this, so it's odd that there's been so much pushback against Coinbase's announcement, as it is basically just adding its voice to the mix. As far as I can tell, Coinbase has been constantly under fire in the crypto media ever since Brian announced that the company was looking to be apolitical in its operations. This eternal backlash might be because most crypto journalists were recruited from more political legacy media outlets. Some major crypto news outlets also reportedly receive funding from other crypto exchanges that are competing directly with Coinbase for users. So, Keep this in mind whenever you see abnormally positive or negative articles about crypto projects or companies. Doing your own research is more important than ever in these circumstances. Research might be why the SEC is taking so long to approve a Bitcoin ETF that seems inevitable at this point. According to Coindesk, the SEC is currently reviewing six Bitcoin ETFs in total, with the two most recent being those filed by Skybridge and Fidelity Digital. The other four come from Vanek, Cryptoin, Wisdom Tree, and Valkyrie, and the SEC could make its final decisions as early as mid-July. That said, it's possible they could extend their review time by nearly another year. Even if all six of these ETF applications are struck down, there are 10 additional ETF applications waiting to be reviewed. Now, as many of you will know, multiple Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs were approved in Canada earlier this year, and they have collectively seen billions of dollars of cautious retail and institutional money invested since then. ETF is short for Exchange Traded Fund, and you can think of it as being similar to a stock. The difference is that additional shares of an ETF can be created or destroyed based on demand. This is because each ETF share is backed by whatever asset it represents. So, for example, if someone buys $10,000 worth of a Bitcoin ETF, the company behind that ETF must go and buy physical Bitcoin to back it. Not surprisingly, a Bitcoin ETF would be rocket fuel for BTC and altcoins given that many institutions are restricted from investing directly in risky asset classes, including existing exchange-traded products like Grayscale's crypto trusts. If you want to learn more about how a Bitcoin ETF could affect the crypto market and why it could signal the top of this bull run, watch my video about that using the link up there in the top right. 
Turning to the crypto market, it looks like the prediction I made in my video about the Wyckoff method was correct. The bull run is far from over, and here's what I think comes next. The spooky dip we saw over the weekend was likely one of the first and possibly the only secondary test in phase B of Wyckoff's accumulation price pattern. I expect that we will continue to bounce between the 32K and 40K range over the next week, possibly even rising higher for a short period of time. We'll probably see a decisive move to the upside at the end of June. On the leaderboards, this week's winners are EngineCoin, Near Protocol, Cardano, Telcoin, and the Curve token. Engine's price action seems to be due to two things. First, Engine airdropped over 50,000 NFTs to people who scanned QR codes on its social media sites. This added nearly 40,000 new Engine token holders and sent Engine's Twitter account over 200k. Second, Engine is one of the projects vying for a parachain slot on Polkadot's relay chain, where it hopes to create a high throughput NFT universe. As I mentioned earlier, Polkadot's parachain slot auctions are just around the corner. Turning to the charts, we can see that Engine is rising quite nicely, but faces some price resistance around the $2 mark. I could see Engine rising as high as $2.70 in the medium term, which is where its next major zone of resistance is. NIR's price action is seemingly being driven by its recent launch of Aurora, a Layer 2 blockchain built on NIR that acts as a Layer 2 blockchain for Ethereum. As part of this launch, NIR became an ERC20 token, and what's interesting is that you can use ETH to pay for fees on the Aurora chain. I'll leave a link to the blog post explaining Aurora in more detail if you're interested. The charts for NIR revealed that it's far from its previous all-time highs, and this could present an opportunity to get in at a discounted price for any NIR bulls. I will just caution that NIR seems to be pretty deep in the hole and will likely have a hard time getting out with all those zones of resistance. Cardano's price action is a bit of a no-brainer considering its smart contract functionality is just around the corner. Cardano's smart contract testnet Alonzo finally launched a couple of days back and it will have three phases with no strict timelines. After that, smart contracts will go live on Cardano. You can see here that ADA has held up quite well against the recent bear trend and seems to be itching to explode back up over the $1.70 range. Now, I can't seem to spot a clear trend here, but given Cardano's size as a cryptocurrency, I imagine it will mirror Bitcoin's sideways price action over the next few days, plus or minus 10%. Telcoin's price action is also quite expected given the continued adoption of its remittance payments platform. More importantly, a Nebraska bill that allows state banks to custody crypto was passed last week, and that bill was apparently drafted by Telcoin. As far as I understand, Telcoin will be relocating its headquarters from Japan to the United States because of this Nebraska bill. The charts reveal that Tel has had a hard time holding up compared to when I last mentioned it as a weekly top performer. While I don't see Tel going much higher than 35 cents in the near term, news of a relocation and continued growth could mean a Binance or Coinbase listing is waiting for Tel on the horizon. Curve Finance's CRV token seems to be rallying in response to the lower gas fees on Ethereum and various liquidity mining programs being spearheaded by new projects Curve is collaborating with. Some of you will know that I'm not a very big fan of CRV's tokenomics, as they're analogous to the Fed's money printer. There is a lot of CRV being minted to pay for yield farming rewards. Now, if you really want to get your hands on CRV, I would take Yearn Finance founder Andre Cronier's advice and quote, don't buy it, earn it. Again, that's his advice, not mine. That's all for today's Coin Bureau Weekly Crypto Review. If you enjoyed it, you know what to do. Hit that like button, subscribe button, and bell icon too. If you want more of me, head on over to Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram to get a sneak peek behind the scenes. If you join my Telegram channel, you'll get the daily crypto updates you crave, and signing up for my weekly newsletter is a great way to get the tools, tips, and tricks you need to get paid. And of course, you can support the channel by heading over to the Coin Bureau merch store and picking up a shirt or hoodie or both. Links to all these resources, including my 20% Binance fee discount, are in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all again shortly. Oh,